we live in a world now where internet platforms collect vast amounts of data about consumers and use that data to help companies target their adverts. Adverts that can and sometimes do include discounts. Is that a problem? Well, most regulators tend to think not, or at least they're concerned about undermining the benefits that consumer information can deliver through regulations that they might impose. For example, the following is a quote from the Council of Economic Advisors in the US. Economic reasoning suggests that differential pricing, whether online or offline, can benefit both buyers and sellers as described above. Thus, we should be cautious about proposals to regulate online pricing, particularly if we believe that online markets are particularly competitive. And similar quotes are available from regulators around the world, including in the UK. It's easy to see that the logic underlying such a position, two standard benchmarks widely known by economists are informative. Consider a market in which a limited number of firms are competing for consumers. If firms do not know which consumers have which values, they will have to set a single price to all consumers. But then there will typically be some consumers excluded from the market. These are consumers a firm could sell to at a price above its marginal cost, but the firm instead sets a higher price because it doesn't want to reduce the price being paid by its other consumers. So gains from trade are left on the table and the outcome is inefficient. On the other hand, if all firms have perfect information about all consumers' preferences and can set different prices to different consumers, then the firms are going to compete for each consumer individually, and no consumer is going to be excluded from the market. In light of this, it's easy to see that an outright ban on differential pricing can do more harm than good. But these benefits are not sufficient for thinking about the power that internet intermediaries have. They have more options available to them than either revealing all information or withholding all information. For example, in part to address privacy concerns, Google has launched its privacy sandbox in which it algorithmically groups consumers into what it terms flocks and then reveals to its advertisers only which flock a person belongs to. How should regulators think about this? Let's consider a simple example. Suppose that there are two museums in a city, a science museum and a natural history museum. An internet platform knows that Annie, Bob, Chloe and Denzel are planning a trip to the city and that they like visiting museums. In fact, let's suppose the internet companies know much more than that. They know how much Annie, Bob, Chloe and Denzel value visiting each museum. In this example, Annie values a trip to the science museum at $8 and a trip to the natural history museum at $2 while Denzel has the opposite preferences, valuing a trip to the Natural History Museum at $8 and a trip to the Science Museum at $2. Bob, on the other hand, values a trip to the Science Museum at $6.5 and a trip to the Natural History Museum at $3.5, while Chloe has the opposite preferences to Bob, valuing a trip to the Natural History Museum at $6.5 and a trip to the Science Museum at $3.5. Let's suppose that the normal price for admission to both museums is $8. With no information, the museums will continue to charge these admission prices. And for the sake of argument, let's resolve indifference in favor of a consumer visiting a museum versus not, and in favor of a consumer visiting their more preferred museum over a less preferred museum. Then, faced with the price of $8 for visiting both museums, Annie will visit the Science Museum, and Denzel will visit the Natural History Museum, but both Bob and Chloe will choose to visit neither museum. This outcome is inefficient. It leaves gains from trade on the table that could be achieved by Bob and Chloe making a visit to a museum. Indeed, if we look at the combinations 
of most of the most producer and consumer surplus that could be obtained in this market, represented by the green line in this picture, we can see that when we give the firms no information, when we give the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum no information, we end up with a consumer surplus and producer surplus combination that's inside the frontier and that is inefficient. Now suppose that the internet platforms instead reveal how much each consumer is willing to pay to both the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum and give the museums a chance to target discounts at each consumer. This is the benchmark of full information that I was talking about before. Let's take Annie as an example and suppose that the Natural History Museum and Science Museum are choosing what discount to offer to Annie. We want to think about what's going to happen in equilibrium so that both the Natural History Museum and the Science Museum are offering a discount that maximizes their profits given the discount offered by the other one. Suppose that the Natural History Museum reduces the price Annie has to pay to $1. Then the Science Museum would want to respond by reducing its price to $7. Annie would then visit the Science Museum. But if Annie would then visit the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum would want to offer a bigger discount to Annie. In equilibrium, we can see that the Natural History Museum is going to end up offering Annie free entry and the Science Museum is going to end up charging Annie a price of $6. Faced with these prices, Annie is going to go to the Science Museum. And we can do a similar exercise for Bob and for Chloe and for Denzel and find the equilibrium prices that will be charged to them. Crucially, Bob and Chloe now face prices at which they want to go to their preferred museum and the outcome is going to be efficient. If we go back to our picture where we were showing the combinations of producer and consumer surplus that are possible, we can see that with full information, we're now on the green frontier and we've actually managed to increase both the amount of producer surplus and the amount of consumer surplus. However, an internet platform might instead group the consumers into flocks. Suppose that in this case, it groups Annie and Chloe together into a yellow flock, and it groups Bob and Denzel together into a green flock. The Science Museum of the Natural History Museum then only learn which flock a person is in, and so must offer the same discount to everybody in the same flock. What discounts will the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum offer to the yellow flock? Well, in equilibrium, the Science Museum is not going to offer any different, any discount, and is going to charge a price of $8, while the Natural History Museum is just going to offer a small discount and charge a price of $6.5. Note that given the Science Museum offers no discount, the Natural History Museum needs to charge a price under $2 in order to get both Annie and Chloe to go. Or, it can charge a price of six and a half dollars and attract just Chloe. Given these options, it finds it most profitable to set the high price and not compete for Annie. Similarly, given the Natural History Museum charges a price of six and a half dollars to the yellow flock, the Science Museum must charge a price under three and a half dollars to attract both Annie and Chloe, or it can charge a price of eight dollars and attract just Annie. Again, it prefers to charge the high price and not compete for Annie uh, and not compete for Chloe. Grouping consumers in this way stops the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum from competing with one another. And the situation is symmetric for the green, for the green flock, but with the roles of the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum reversed. So if we go back to our picture and we look at the combination of producer-consumer surplus that's obtained now by this grouping of consumers, we see that we're on the efficient frontier again, but now there's no consumer surplus. All the possible with surplus is being extracted as producer surplus. 
an alternative way in which the internet company might group consumers is with Annie and Bob being in the yellow block and Chloe and Denzel being in the green block. Interestingly, if they group consumers in this way, they're actually going to enhance comp in competition in comparison to the full information benchmark. What's going to happen now is that for the yellow flock, the Natural History Museum is going to offer free entry. And the Science Museum is going to respond by offering a low enough price that both Annie and Bob want to go. And the opposite is how going to happen for the green flock. For the green flock, the Science Museum is going to offer free entry and the Natural History Museum is going to offer a low enough price that both Chloe and Denzel want to go. So now we're going to get an outcome that's much better for consumers. And again, if we go back to this picture and look at the surpluses, we see now that when consumers are grouped like this, we're obtaining much more consumer surplus than before, than with the other way of grouping consumers, and much more surplus even than we obtained with full information. I've walked you through a toy example, but this example illustrates some general underlying results that are in our paper, allowing for any number of consumers, more than two firms, any distribution of consumer values, consumers can still often be grouped to achieve similar outcomes. Under mild conditions, there's a way to group consumers such that in equilibrium, all possible consumer surplus is extracted as producer surplus. If the internet platform instead wants to maximize consumer surplus, it can do that too. There's going to be a lower bound on producer surplus that must always be respected. Suppose a firm's competitors all set a price equal to their marginal cost. The firm then always has the option of ignoring anything that the internet platform tells it and setting a single price to all its consumers that maximizes its profits, given its competitors are charging a price equal to their marginal cost. And this obtains some minimal amount of profit that the firm can always achieve. What we show is that it's always possible to group consumers in a way such that this is all the profits, all the producer surplus that each firm gets. And the outcome is efficient. And so we must be maximizing the amount of surplus that consumers can get. This gives us the two extreme points you see on the, on the green frontier in the picture. We also show that any intermediate point between these two can also be obtained by the internet platform. The thing I'd like you to take away from this is that information about consumers can be very powerful. The final thing I'd like to mention is that several of the properties that were true about the producer surplus maximizing and consumer surplus maximizing flocks from our example also hold in general. In particular, the producer surplus maximizing flocks always group consumers with different most preferred products and induce a niche market strategy where firms price in a way such that they only sell to the highest value consumers in the group. In contrast, in the consumer surplus maximizing flock, only consumers with the same most preferred product are grouped together and firms are induced to play a mass market strategy in which they sell to all consumers in the group. So if we come back to the question of whether flocks are good or not for consumers, we can see that the devil is in the detail. Thank you.